Welcome back to Newsday. The suspended Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Beta Edu, has threatened to sue the BBC of an article that stated that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission recovered 30 billion naira from her as part of an ongoing fraud investigation. The notice to sue was served the British public broadcaster by Dr. Edu's lawyers, Ojuku Chikasolu and Co., in a letter dated 9th April 2024. It accused the BBC of peddling innuendos and insinuations over the said amount of money, as well as a claim that 50 bank accounts connected with the recovered funds were all linked with the suspended minister. It also accused the BBC of suggesting that Dr. Ed, Ed was guilty without presumption of innocence, which it says should be fundamental in any fair and unbiased reporting, and to give an ultimatum of 48 hours from the date of the notice for the BBC to issue and publish a retraction of a suit of $50 million. Well, we are now being joined by a lawyer, First Baba Issa, to discuss this ongoing probe into the activities of the suspended minister and the need for a quick resolution of the matter. Good day and welcome to Newsday. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, of course, we can say that Berta Edu is saying she has no link with the 30 billion naira purportedly recovered by the EFCC, and she has even threatened to sue the BBC if it does not retract its report. What are your thoughts on this? Should she be suing the BBC or the EFCC? Well, um, Dr. Berta Edu is well within her rights to sue the BBC. Uh, for publishing a dis disparaging report, which is false, which has been found out to be false against her, is damaging to her reputation and all of that. Um, I don't think the BBC actually fact-checked that publication before they published that misleading and false report. And I don't think that Dr. Beta should be suing the EFCC because the EFCC didn't say that. Uh, the AFCC, according to my own fact check, has their own channels of communicating with the people. They have their social media handles, they have their Facebook page, they have their X account. And in their interaction with the media, the EFCC never said that 30 billion naira or dollars have been traced to the minister. Neither did the EFCC said, as far as my own fact check is concerned, that uh, 50 accounts have been traced to the Honorable Minister. So I wonder where BBC and I wonder where other news channels got this false report from. So the Honorable Minister is well waiting a right to say, come, BBC, uh, a media organization of that statue understands should do better than that. They should be able to fact check information before publishing. And if they have not fact check this, this publication or this information, then they should retract and issue an apology or the minister will go to court. But uh, you see, I think that Nigerians should start getting very concerned within especially the social economic context of all this brouhaha. Nigerians should really start getting concerned. I, I don't know, Nigerians are concerned mostly uh, discussing whether the minister should remain suspended or the minister should be recalled and all of that. There's one key area that should be like the denominator in all this discussion and that is the fact that the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Elevation has been under lock and key since the minister was suspended. And this ministry is supposed to be like the flagship ministry of the President's Renew Hope agenda, especially now when Nigerians are going through very turbulent times, excruciating hardship. Where is the conditional cash transfer? Where are the social intervention and social investment programs. What is happening? Nigerians need to ask this question. What is happening with the long investigation that we can't seem to find an end to? So until these questions are asked and answered, until the president takes a decisive you know, step towards ending this, they will continue to have all these speculations and false reports that are going round and round and round about what is happening with the investigations and what is happening with the ministry. Certainly, this is where we are. Well, you sp I, I like that you raised um, the fact that this case has been stalling for a while. From a legal standpoint... They lost me. 
I can't hear them. They lost me. Can you hear me? Okay, we're going to take a quick break and reconnect with um, Barrister Fis Baba Isa in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Newsday. Thank you for staying with us. I believe we still have um, Barrister Fist Babaisa, who's discussing the ongoing probe into the activities of the suspended minister, that's Better Edu, and the BBC. Thank you so much for your patience. Please confirm that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for, for your patience. Now, earlier on um, in your response, you did say that this case has been dragging for a while and, to, and until the president takes a decisive action, there will continue to be speculation like what we're seeing in the case of, or potential speculation like what might be the case with the BBC. From a legal standpoint, why do you think that this case is taking so long to be resolved? Well, I, 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 I can't tell for sure, but I, I only say that I expected that uh, the matter will be the matter should have been resolved uh, expeditiously, and uh, respectfully, it's a disappointment that we are where we are, because uh, I I feel that being that it's a ministry that is key to delivering the dividends of democracy to the people, which is in tandem with the supposed agenda of the president. I think that the president should have concluded this thing as quick as possible. Uh, let me give you three points. The first point is this one. This ministry should be functioning because Nigerians need this ministry to function. Nigerians need programs that this ministry manages that should, you know, alleviate the poverty and the hardship in the land. That is one. Then secondly, uh, I feel that if the president has shown courage in suspending the minister when there were allegations of corruption, then if this minister has been found, the investigation has found this minister not culpable, then the minister should be reinstated. Or if the investigation shows otherwise, then the, 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 the president should talk. The ministry should function. Because now, tomorrow we'll wake up and hear that the minister has been cleared. But the minister is not being reinstated. So this silence creates a lacuna for a lot of politics to be played. You know, uh, people every day are making sure that they bring different rumors because of the, of the president's silence. The rumors are coming, today the minister is cleared, today they say they find 50 million naira, today they say they find 30 billion, 50 accounts, all in the minister's name. So it is this silence that causes this kind of things to happen. Then totally and most importantly, I, I, I think that the minister is a young person. You know, we have this jungle mentality in Nigeria. When somebody's accused of a crime, everybody just wants to see the person crucified. Uh, we don't want to ask silent questions, both legal questions and moral questions. In the course of this investigation, we've heard that the decisions, the procedural decisions, or so the procedural omission that the minister was accused of, I, she actually got clearance from the villa. Did she get clearance from the villa? The villa should talk to us. If she did get clearance from the villa, that means that the the minister acted by following an order from her principal as a young person. Should she be crucified for carrying out a directive? Because my understanding, I'm not a politician, I'm not in APC, but we all watch that when during the campaigns, the minister was the face of the young people, the minister was the face of the women, people campaigning for the president. And uh, when she was announced to be the minister, we all had this understanding, this feeling that uh, a kind of father-daughter, mentee-mentor relationship was blooming between the president and the minister. So in this kind of situation, we expect that the minister will be protected by the president in trying to mentor her to say, okay, this is how you do things, this is how you don't do things, okay, you have made this mistake, uh, if it is costly, okay, I'm going to deal with you like this, if it's not costly, we can recall you. I mean, if, I wrote an article yesterday and I was wondering, if this was the minister's biological, if it was the president's biological child, would she be treated like that? Would she be thrown out there in the cold with nobody talking to her, grappling, or grappling mental health Baba issues, Baba. her young career in the balance? Allow yes. me to interrupt you. So, allow me, uh, allow me to interrupt you briefly for the yes, sake sir. of time. 
that seems we are mixing yes. emotions, you know, with the issue on ground. We have allegation of corruption, you know, to the tune of a very large amount of money. And a number of Nigerians are hopeful, you know, that this investigation will birth far-reaching reforms and government intervention programs, and that it will also help curb corruption in government agencies. So I'm wondering, how would you advise the authorities to balance conducting a credible investigation with protecting the interest of vulnerable Nigerians? This is about national interest now. It is not a family discussion between father and daughter. Well, if you have ever been landed, there are actually three prong issues. That angle, the emotional angle is there, the father-daughter relationship is there. Now, the, the, the point is that if you're talking about the investigation, as you have said, has it not taken long enough? That's what we're saying. This is why there are all this speculation. So has the EFCC cleared the minister? Our concern, personally my concern as a Nigerian is, we want the ministry to function. And if the minister has been clear, she should be recalled. That's what we are saying. That is the first aspect of it. And the second aspect that you see, I agree. I'm not even pretending. There's an emotional angle to it. You can't discuss this issue without emotions. There's an emotional angle to it. But now the factual argue, the issue of administration of criminal justice, what is happening? Don't you as a Nigerian, don't I as a Nigerian, deserve some kind of explanation? Why the silence? Now, if the president had the courage to suspend a minister, where is the courage to say, okay, you have been found culpable or you have been found not culpable? Do you, do you enjoy the silence? Because I don't enjoy the silence. So, as I said earlier, there is this aspect of jungle justice in our mentality. And that's what I'm not, I don't like, whereby somebody has been accused and there is constant media trial. Constant media trial. The BBC has gotten involved. Um, a lot of other um, media houses are getting involved. Every day there's speculation. If the president is talking to us, if the investigation people responsible for it are talking to us, will there be room for these speculations? So that's my concern. Right. Then, if they come up to say, this is what is happening, she has been found culpable or not, then we, we, we will have a, a way forward about the whole issues. Okay, great. Now, we do know that, to a large extent, the BBC is known for its journalistic integrity and rigorous fact-checking fact -checking processes. Now, in the event that this report is found to actually be accurate and in public interest, could this lawsuit be considered what um, it's called a strategic lawsuit against public participation the abbreviation for that is SLAPP, aimed at intimidating the media and chilling free speech. Well, uh, you know, in defamation, when, when the issue of defamation comes up, you know, are you, as a journalist or as uh, a media house, and somebody have accused you or filed a suit or write a letter to you to say, okay, you have defamed my character, that what you put out there is false. The onus is on you to say, no, what I put out there is not false. So justification is a defense in any suit for defamation. So we cannot begin to speculate now, draw conclusion that uh, there's intimidation of journalists or intimidation of media houses. The onus is now on the BBC. In quoting you, you say they are known for uh, journalistic, journalistic integrity and all of that. It's time for them to prove it. So where, who said, which report did they get, where was it said that this minister was found with 30 billion or 50 accounts? Of course, we want to know, I want to know, I just as I think you want to do, Nigerians want to know that. Of course, if they come up to say, okay, we have a justification for that, yes, the report is true, then the defamation suit is gonna fail. It's gonna fail, it fails everywhere. But if they can't justify that, then they are liable for defamation. There's a thin line, you know. There's duty, there's obligation, and we must balance it. So we want to hear from the media houses, we want to hear from Arise, we want to hear from channels, we want to hear from BBC, but we want to hear truth. We want to hear facts. We don't want to hear uh, conjectures. We don't want to hear uh, outright falsehood. When that happens, the person has the right to say, you have defamed my character, and the media house or the journalists
can now plead justification and say, it's true. So the onus is on BBC to say what we publish is true. Their journalistic integrity, in quoting you, has now been put to the test. I hope they pass the test. For our own good, we all hope they pass the test. Now, earlier you talked about silence from the president, you know, and I'm just wondering, could a silence be due to the fact that investigations have not yet been completed? We do know, you know, that sometimes the wheels of justice grind slowly. So is that enough reason to dismiss the case and recall the minister or, you know, fire the minister? Because I, I'm a bit confused as to what you're really suggesting. We've seen this long process in other cases, like the probe of former bank MDs and even the immediate past central bank you know, governor. So I'm wondering what exactly it is you're saying. If the investigations have not <coughs> been completed, shall the president go ahead and give a directive? What exactly are you saying? No, no, no. That is not what I'm suggesting at all. I'm suggesting that the, what I'm saying uh, is that the Ministry of Mineral Affairs and Poverty Elevation is, very, is a very important ministry to Nigerians. It is an important ministry even to realizing the president's goals and objectives of the renewed hope agenda. And I'm saying that if the investigation is not done, then it's disappointing that it's taking so long. So you cannot begin to cite cases where investigations took so long before they concluded. Were you impressed with the investigations taking so long? Nobody or anywhere in the world is impressed with investigations that last as if they want to last forever or they last to the detriment of uh, the common man. In this case, I've told you that you can fact check me that the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, at the last time I checked, is under lock and key. Nothing is happening there. No cash transfers, nothing. So it is within my right as a Nigerian and the right of anybody to say, come, what is happening if the investigations are not concluded? We thought this was a straightforward thing. Conclude this investigation so that you can either recall the minister or appoint a new minister or just let the ministry start functioning. So that is my stand. I'm not saying uh, when the investigation is not concluded, the president must talk. The question is, why is the investigator not concluded now several months after? It should All be right. a, a straightforward thing. All right, we'd like yes. to thank you for your time, Barrister Fis Babaisa. Thank you for joining us here on Newsday. We appreciate your time.